Thanks for joining me and welcome to episode 28 entitled The Quiet Before the Storm, covering the period from 1820 to September 1821. So at the end of episode 26 we have Hongi Hika returning from England to the Bay of Islands after 17 months away. He is now armed to the teeth and plunges straight into preparations for war. To think that everything was quiet in New Zealand whilst he was away would be wrong. Let's look at this timeline from 1820 to 1821 to see what else was happening and put the next episode into perspective. So we have Hongi, Waikato and Kendall departing here and returning to New Zealand here. Their trip is covered in episode 26. Marsden arrives just before Hongi's departure for England. It is his third visit since his first in December 1814. He visits a number of tribes in his nine month stay. He trips down to the Auckland area, then with guides walks from Riverhead in Auckland back to the Bay of Islands via the Kuiper and Hokianga. It takes him 15 days. Captain Cruz from episode 27 also visits Auckland. In 1821, the Waikato tribes attacked Te Rao Paraha, or we know him as Te Raupraha, at his base in the Kafia Harbour area. This is a major invasion involving thousands. Te Rao Paraha has been a real pest to the Waikato tribes, and they've had enough. They defeat Te Rao Paraha's Ngāti Toa tribe and their allies. Tarao Paraha is forced to leave his tribal land around Kafia and head south to Taranaki and tribes that he's related to. This will have huge repercussions in the years to come for many. Korokoro, a Napui chief from Kororaka area, in late 1819 teams up with Ngāti Pawa of Auckland for an attack on Ngāti Baru at Totrapa near Thames. Crazy as it seems, in 1821 Napui will attack the Ngāti Pawa on the Tamaka River. This often happens. One year you are fighting with other tribes, the next year against them. It's all rather complicated. In Maridim, such things are easy to explain. It's all to do with relative Utu. The year before 1819, Hongi and Tumaringa led two independent forces to the Bay of Plenty and devastated that area for most of 1819. This is covered in episode 25. Tumaringa sets off again to the Bay of Plenty, Tauranga in this case, but this is a short sortie and he returns after gaining some satisfaction from Naitalangi. Tareha, a Ngāpui chief from the Waitangi area, takes a large war party to the Kuiper to get satisfaction from Ngāti Whātua. But even though he is superior in muskets, he is routed and sent packing back home by the brilliant chief Murupanga. Tumorenga departs with a force for the Hauraki to attack the Makoya Pa. Little is known of this sortie. He returns with heads and slaves, but does not defeat the Ngāti Pawa. His return is a few days before Hongi's return from England. Pomare and Tawera, Napui chiefs from the southern part of the bay, depart for a year-long campaign through the Bay of Plenty again and down the east coast as far as the Mahia Peninsula. A very successful campaign with heads and slaves galore. They return in December 1820. The Ami O Whenua, well, this is a classic. Ami O Whenua means encircling the land. And what we have here are a number of tribes that decide to combine their forces and go on a killing spree around the country, seeking Utu, of course. They make their way from the Kuiper down through Auckland, then through the Waikato and Rotorua, through the Uruweras and down the east coast and so on, going as far south as Wellington before making their way up the west coast. The main group 
was Nati Fatua from Auckland, Samoy Kato, Tialoa from Rotorua, and other adventurers who joined them as they came through. The total force was around 1,000. They had muskets, but not big numbers. This force will feature in other episodes. So that gives you a taste of other warring parties besides Hongi. And trust me, this is not exhaustive. We now turn our attention back to Hongi. Since his return, he has planned with most of the Napui chiefs in the bay to assemble a force to head south and attack Auckland and the Tem tribes. The force that assembles in Kirikiri is over 2,000 warriors and over 50 canoes. They have a staggering 1,000 muskets between them. Hongi will be the supreme leader. So let's just take a look at how these things work. With 2,000 warriors, the logistics are huge. Feeding such a horde will rely on taking initial provisions, potatoes, kumara, pork, slaves, food on the hoof, so to speak. But sustenance will mainly be by living off the crops and flesh of those being attacked. Each chief is in charge of warriors from his hapu. The chiefs meet and decide on tactics, VIP targets, where the prisoners will be taken and how any battle will be prosecuted. A chief has the right to disagree with a plan and do his own thing. This is where the mana of Hongi is so important. Cases of chiefs being dissatisfied or having their mana questioned are known to have just withdrawn from the battle and gone home in a huff. Hongi, in coordinating this huge force to act in a cohesive manner, is a testimony to his mana and leadership. Hongi will go into battle over the next two years wearing his red British officer's tunic, given to him by the Governor of New South Wales, his coat of mail and his helmet that King George IV gave him in London. In fact, it would become a sign that battle is about to commence in earnest, when Hongi dons this outfit. In battle, Hongi is accompanied by a number of slaves who continually reload his many muskets as he blazes away. <laughs> he also has a couple of pistols. You would expect a commander like Hongi to be at the back of his forces. His death or injury would shatter morale, but no, he is invariably in the thick of things. His helmet and chainmail save him on a number of occasions. So the Napui forces are gathered in Kerikeri. Keri. Missionaries report that military manoeuvres were conducted on the Kerikeri Keri River on Tuesday, the 4th of September, in preparation for departure. The following morning, Wednesday the 5th of September, 1821, Hongi and several chiefs breakfast with the Reverend John Butler in Kerikeri. Keri. The fleet of war canoes departs Kerikeri Keri at noon for the killing fields of Auckland. The coming spring and summer will be the bloodiest that Marydom has seen. The musket wars will go from the killing and enslavement of hundreds to the killing and enslavement of thousands. So that's it for now. Hope you enjoyed this. Next, the next episode, episode 29, starts off from where this left off. So I hope to see you again then, but until then, take it easy. <laughs>